God. I love you so much, Hashem, and I just want the whole world to know that I know that you're real, that I know that you're watching, that I know when a person dies, his soul is going to be judged on high. I know that karma exists. I know that sometimes you put us through tests to strengthen us like you did to the Jews when they were slaves in Egypt so that they should humble their spirit before they were ready to receive the Torah. They had to be refined. They had to be cleansed. They had to be purified. That's why Hashem says in the Torah, and be holy because I'm holy. And remember one time the kids asked me, what does it mean to be holy, coach? I said to stay away from everything that's unholy. TikTok, unholy. Instagram, unholy. Facebook, unholy. And yeah, I understand on Facebook you have a page that you do this. I'm not saying no, you talk to your family. And even if you guard it, still you're going to see uh, commercials, things pop up. Girls, maybe that will, they'll suggest you as a friend that will be dressed in modest. It's just not good. I have it, and I have, I think, four people I'm friends with. Really, I should just cancel that page. There's really no reason for me to have it. Uh, Instagram, I have a page, but I, don't, I think I have one per. I don't even go there. Stay away from these things, man. They're dangerous. You understand? Social media is dangerous. It's dangerous for your mental health. You know why? I tell you why. Because it's a bunch of people gossiping, talking bad about each other, threatening each other, bragging about how they look, disrespecting those that don't have what they have. And I remember Boaz in the Torah I was reading how he looked down on Manoah, the father of Samson. Because he wasn't so learned in Torah And he got punished for that you know? He didn't invite him to any of his parties I think when he had kids he didn't invite him Because he didn't have kids So he was like well, what kind of gifts could he give me So Hashem had to humble Boaz Hashem is no joke in the Torah He will humble you And humble you Badly Bad met like that Very badly Look what he did to San Karim Look what he did to Nebuchadnezzar he made them like animals that they had to feed from the grass. You know what it means to feed from the grass? <laughs> Listen, I told this one guy, man, your wife goes on the beach with a bikini? He said, yeah. I said, I want you to explain to me what's the difference between a bikini and bras and a panty. I just want you to explain it to me. He said, well, you know, it's designed this way. It has this card. It has that card. I said, Listen. It's covering the same amount of skin. Would we at least give each other that, right? It's only covering 10% of your wife. The rest of it is open for everybody to see. Even the top is cut low to expose everything. Why would you want everybody looking at your wife, bro? It doesn't make sense to me. And I explained to him and I told him one of the most beautiful things from Hashem. Because when your wife is dressed like that and she's sexy and good looking, it's going to bring you problems. Dudes might start kicking it to her in front of you. You're going to get mad. It's going to bring you drama, bro. Trust me. Trust me. Especially if she's going to flirt with them or try to act cute. Oh, my goodness, bro. That's playing with the devil right there. You understand? That's when you call out the wolves, the hyenas, the jackals. They come out like animals. You understand? This world is psychotically dangerous, bro. You have to be very, very careful, bro, what you're dealing with. Because once the evil... Is injected into society Then it starts to populate Multiply Infect And make the people go away from God And it's dangerous And that's why social media is dangerous Because it pushes you away from God It becomes a block for you and God How are you going to believe in God When you look at some of the things on TikTok It's complete waste of time It's like the Satan is running TikTok To make you waste your time on nonsense Yo, it's how Dumb could it be You know like in wrestling How far could they take it So they went far And people died Hashem told them Stay in your lane Go this far And that's it How far are you gonna take it bro Bottom line is you see That it's all a waste of time Heaven Heaven Man King Solomon What a lesson we learned From King Solomon King David King Solomon uh, and other great leaders that fell with women With the temptation of women It's not one or two It's a lot A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot It's scary That's why the Torah is always telling you 
First he says the Vavchem Because that's where the sin is really starting Your heart is already corrupt Then with your eyes you're already looking to sin You understand? Well I like that Let me break it down to you yo, And just teach you some of the things that I recently learned Let's talk about Samson and Delilah Number one he was a reincarnation of Nadav How do we know it? Because they call him Badan Badan from the tribe of Dan So flip the letters It spells Nadav That's number one Nadav sinned with his eyes with Goyot Samson sinned with his eyes With Goyot Three times he was with girls That were not Jewish He went up against the Torah And sinned with Goyot Three times I don't remember the name of his first wife Then they had the prostitute he was with And then Delilah And there was a riddle that he had that uh, With him eating carne out of a lion That he killed a year earlier He told his father that he liked the way this woman looked So his eyes were on her and they told him, but there's nobody from your own people that you could pick as a wife. You got to go for this girl. But he insisted. And what people didn't know is that he was born in Azir. Why? With the mission to be holy. Why? So Hashem could rest his spirit on him to punish the Kishtim. This whole story of Samson and Delilah was just to punish the Kishtim. That's why Hashem kept making him make pretexts to go to war. With the Plishtim By the way the Plishtim in the Torah You should know they were from Crete From Greece And they were the type of people That they were very into their body Very into their looks They were very into the physical material world That's why they hated this Jew Who was one guy by himself Humble Blessed with tons of strength That they could not kill him They could not beat him They could not defeat him They tried everything in their power To defeat him And in the end they caught him And when they were mocking him one day he called out to Hashem and he said to Hashem, please, I beg you just one more time. Use my body and give me power. So he rested his hands on these two pillars and he pushed with all his might. And the whole building came down. 3,000 men and women died. And that's a true story. That's how, yo, Samson was no joke. I think they said he killed more people in his death than he did in his life. That was a Nazir from birth. He didn't have a choice. That's why I applied different laws applied to him. That's why he could touch a dead body. He could do certain things that other Nazirim were not allowed to do. So we see that Hashem used Samson to destroy the Plishtim. To warn them. To punish them. To rebuke them. To teach them. Not to ever go against the nation of Israel. You would have to be the dumbest country to go against Israel. Because you see, just from the history, every time a nation oppressed the Jews, they got oppressed. The Russians, the Iranians, the Greeks, the Egyptians. It goes on and on. Look at that thunder in the background. That's how I want to say, Racha, blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who makes wonders with nature. Amen. Love you, Hashem. You shouldn't really say amen after a bracha. But sometimes I get excited, so I say it like to validate it. But I have to learn to not say it and let the angels in Shemaim say amen for me. I could say amen to that. Hashem, I love you so much, man. I love being infused with your word. I love learning how to navigate through this world. I love learning how to be a good judge, to judge myself correctly, how when to get. Uh, tough when not to get tough when I judge other people to always judge them favorably unless it's somebody who showed me that they're a snake then if they showed you Chazaka they're a snake no problem my advice to you stay away from them if you have to be around them no they're a snake that's it there's no shame in protecting yourself from the wicked it's actually honorable you understand we know that from Pinchas I like to use that example because he killed Zimri Ben Salu and Cosby both of them he killed. Why? Because they went did an act against God. The Pharisee. Even though they were in the tent, everybody understood what they went in there to do. And he did it in front of Moshe Rabbeinu. And Moshe Rabbeinu froze. Maybe he got so mad that he, he that's it. The law eluded him. But Pinchas didn't get mad. Pinchas just was calm enough to know. Now it's a time for action. It's not a time for staying quiet. There's certain times in life you'll know you must act right now. There's no time to think. That's why Hashem says you can break Shabbat when it comes to Pekuach Nefesh, life and death. 
That's why, God forbid, a baby falls, hits his head. Yeah, maybe you give him some ice. He's four years old. No problem. He'll be okay. But in a situation like that, you can almost treat it like, God forbid, he can get sick. You just don't know. It could be like life and death. So you'll be able to drive him to the doctor. My suggestion to you is just to sit him down, put ice, and pray to Hashem with all your might that he'll be okay. Obviously, if you see him turning blue when things don't look good, for sure you take him. But don't be like these people, yo, that are just so afraid. Like now with COVID, yo, it's two and a half years later. Now they're starting again with this garbage for masks, masks in schools. Like if you didn't figure this out by now, then Hashem is telling you, put the mask, bro. No problem. Put the mask, don't breathe, and God bless. What do you want us to tell you, bro? You can't be that much of a fool to not know that they're exaggerating this, that they're making this up. They're using it to gain control. They're oppressing the people. They're making up lies. They're changing the data. They're presenting the data in a way that does isn't the way it's supposed to be presented to show you, to trick you. That's why when they do their little polls, look at the bottom. Ten people interviewed. <laughs> and they're making the poll like it's representing the whole universe. You know, these people are snakes. Dirty. And the media was set up just to throw you off track. That's the Satan's biggest weapon. Is the media, bro. That's it. It's all the pornography. That's media. You know, you'd have to admit this, man. This is what it means to be real. And represent this all around the right way. The one who really serves Hashem the best is the Satan. When he's dispatched, he's never... Did that. How many times did you wake up in the morning... Too tired to pray And maybe God forbid Skipping to pray The Satan does it When he's dispatched To make justice He goes Not only does he go He's willing to go He wants to go He's excited to go Ready to run his course You understand And I like what it said Let the evil run its course Sometimes you might fight against Wicked evil people But you don't realize That Hashem wants to destroy them So he gives them long life To feed them for all the good deeds They did in order to get rid of them and punish them for all the sins they committed. And in the interim, if they do tshuva, beautiful, it's a bonus. The best. That's why Hashem will probably take all your sins and turn them into mitzvot. Why? Because after 50 years entrenched in a sin, you were able to kick it, get out of it, and recognize God as the only one sole creator. That's it. That's priceless right there. So right there, all your sins will be converted into mitzvot. You don't understand when you're dealing with God which is every second of your life you're dealing with the most incredible judge ever there's no bias there's no nothing it's just the pure unfiltered truth there's no it, it, it's it's you know what it is though I'm gonna tell you exactly what it is it's only God can make these calculations like the revenge you know revenge would seem like something you'd be able to do in the Torah Somebody did did you wrong, so you do them wrong. The karma, you get them back. What goes around comes around. You could dispense justice. Here, Hashem, what's the problem? The problem is you're not going to know how to dispense the justice. You're going to know he needs to be slapped. How many times does he need to be slapped? <laughs> that could be off by 150. He might need one little patch on his hand. You might give him 150 slaps to the face. That's why you sit back, fall back, and let God judge and let him dispense the justice. And if God forbid somebody embarrassed you, did something wrong to you, by you claiming it's injustice, you will now bring injustice on yourself. You better be careful. Don't ever let these words leave your lips. Where is the justice, God? Try never to say that, yo, may we never say that. Amen. Because if you say that, it's an indication that you're truly not trusting God. And that's dangerous because when you really take a step back and look at it, especially in the future, when you look back, you'll know exactly where he was. Exactly. It's almost like people in the Holocaust. They said, where was God? Then after the Holocaust, a lot of them escaped in the most miraculous ways. They realized where God is right there. Sometimes a father lets his kid get beat up at the park. To teach him a lesson I know it sounds vicious It sounds rude It sounds arrogant It sounds Where's the, He's your son he, If he's that tough of a kid And he needs to get broke Sometimes you let him get broke You understand? Lo aleinu But I'm just telling you How it goes bro That's why it says in the Torah When you deal with a snake You can act like a snake Don't be ashamed 
don't be ashamed. You have to protect yourself. Yaakov did it with Lavan. When he made them go mate the calves and the sheep, sorry, the sheep mate by the watering hole. That's where they made it. So he would put rods with speckles and freckles on it. And then when they would mate, they would look at these rods and it would affect their babies. So all the babies that were born with freckles and speckles went to Yaakov. And the ones that were born pure white, which was very, very few, went to Lavan. And that's how he was able to get all his money back. He tricked them. It's not a problem. But I suggest, and even Yaakov Avinu would tell you, in the end, if there's a way where you could fall back and let God trick him, it's even better. Because only God knows the exact amount of punishment that this person deserves. Sometimes you could see somebody that's very righteous and he may be the most wicked, dirtiest, impure person you'll ever know in your life. And, and sometimes the opposite. Sometimes it's the complete opposite, bro. You might look at somebody like he's a total wreck guy. And he can have a mitzvah that makes him outshine you any day. And Shammai, I save four women from being raped in his building. I don't know. You didn't see it. You'll never know. He's nasty. He's rude. His dog barks by the park all day. Nobody can sleep. Whatever. He'll get his punishment. But Hashem will reward him for saving those four women. That's real talk, man. That's why I love Hashem so much. That's why His justice is such justice. Because it's perfect judgment. He's not favoring anybody, bro. Nobody. Go check in the Torah how he said to the Jews, simple to your face, now that you went against me, I'm going to side with your enemy and punish you. I said, now you became my enemy. Go look in the book of Kings if Hashem didn't say that. Man, yo, Yiftach got leprosy. His limbs fell off. That's why it says that he was buried in different cities. How could be someone be buried in different cities? Because if he walked into one city and his arm fell off, they buried it there and continued into the next city. Then another limb fell and they buried it over there. Wow, he's not got a very bad punishment. I mean, probably because he sacrificed his daughter and the vow could have been annulled if he just would have went to Pinchas, but he didn't humble himself. Pinchas as well, 42 years, he lost the priesthood, his ancestors. Why? I tell you why, his descendants, you know why? Because he didn't go to Yiftach to annul the vow. And he knew that the vow could have been annulled right by the onset. Because the way he said the vow, we already made it annulled. How? I prove it to you. Because he said, the first thing that comes out of my house, I'll sacrifice. You can't sacrifice a human being to God. So the vow by its inception was already tainted. So that would have nullified the vow right there. But nobody told him. Hashem blinded everybody. Why? Because Hashem wanted to punish him. That's how he does it. He's so gangster, yo. You should be very careful when you play with God. You know why? Because then he'll start to play with you. And when he plays with you, be careful, bro. It's not going to be a fair fight, yo. I'm telling you right now. And he's going to humble you. And he's going to let you know that he's running the show. And before he humbles you and lets you know he's running the show, he's going to let you grow, yo, bro. Let it go and know that God is running the show, bro. Because if you do that, you'll be blessed for a long, long time. Let's see if Hashem can remind me of some of the other things I've learned over the last couple of days. Some lessons to teach you all about Yiftach. He got upset that the king didn't respect him, but it was some great king. So we learned from there, like... Why are you looking for honor from a king, an immortal human being? The next day, this king could be overthrown and be, a, and be a, I don't know what, bro, clean the streets, God forbid. If we're going from a king to cleaning the streets, that can humble you more than anything you can ever know. And you're going to go and be worried about his opinion of you? I wouldn't be. I would only be worried of God's opinion from you, you know what I mean? And that's what we learned about Yiftach getting insulted, that the king did not call out to him as a king. 42,000 people died when the tribe of Ephraim went against Yiftach. Wow. From my own nation, my own people. That's Jew on Jew crime. That's a problem. That's why it's crazy to me. There's black on black crime and nobody talks about it. All the black leaders, like Black Lives Matter, why are you not marching over black on black crime? 
If Black Lives Matter so much, if there's any crime you should be marching on, it should be black on black crime. But it's not. I wonder why, yo. It's amazing, yo. The one thing, although there's many, many things I learned from the Torah, but the one thing I learned from the Torah is just watch. Don't listen to what a person says ever. They could say and look at you in the most cutest way and want you dead. Just look at their actions. And when they do something that looks kind of eh-eh, double check it. And if it still looks eh-eh, triple check it. And if it still looks eh-eh, then you know there's something off right there. Stay away from that person. Because you would know yourself, yo, I would never do that to that person. So right away, there's a barometer that will, a spiritual check. An alarm will go off in your soul to let you know, yo, this person went too far with that. And then you know. That's what the Torah would do. It would open up your brain to gain extreme knowledge. To know how to judge the people. To know how to judge yourself. Even more importantly, how to judge God. Yes, I said it. Judge God. Can a man judge God? Of course not. But does he? Absolutely. That's human nature to judge. Where's the justice? It's not fair. Then you're judging God. Don't do that. Don't do that. The best course of action when dealing with God is to give him his respect to move out of the way pray to him for mercy and let him destroy who he needs to destroy it's pretty simple yo it's like this girl today said they said how do you keep in such good shape she's like 40 years old she gave one of the best answers ever heard she said I don't eat that much meat I drink tons of water I get sleep take my vitamins and there was one other thing she said just like that quick and it was like such a little Advice it didn't even sound that good, but it really was amazing advice. Don't eat too much meat is a hundred percent right. The meat is hard to digest, yo. So that you have to give your stomach a break. You eat meat seven times a day, you're you're gonna run into stomach problems because it's gonna be too heavy of a load for your stomach to handle. That's number one. Number two, don't eat too much bread. Bread is the same thing, very hard to digest. Number three, don't eat things that will crack your teeth, bro. Be very careful what you put in your mouth, man. Your teeth are precious. And if you lose them, it can be hard to replace them, even if you get an implant. It can just still be uncomfortable. It's not sticking right. It's this, it's that. that. Things can pop up. Your natural, original teeth are the greatest things to keep. Yo, trust me when I tell you. Another thing is don't brush too much. A lot of us, when we brush, we tend to brush very, very, very hard. If you're going to brush very lightly, my suggestion is... is just to get that biofilm off. Either get a scaler and just kind of rub against the tooth and take it off. Wet a napkin, do it. Do it even through a water pick. Or just make sure the water's fresh. If water smells off, do not put it in your mouth to brush your teeth, to gargle with it. I don't care. The water in New York smells like that. I wouldn't suggest you uh, use the water from the tap in New York. It smells nasty. I mean, it's not that bad, but it's enough that you smell it, so that'd be a clear indication to stay away from drinking that water. A lot of rust, a lot of arsenic, a lot of lead, a lot of impurities in it. You understand? And I know people that drink that water and claim it's delicious. <laughs> That's because the palate will get used to that water, so you'll think it's decent when it's not, you know? Ask a French guy to drink cooked wine and see if he doesn't make a face. He will. Because his palate, his tongue is already used to what? Sweet, natural wine. Alright, let's see. I got this bro. Let me go to some of my notes. Which I don't really like doing. But once in a while I do it. For the grace of God I do it. You can see some of the things that's oh I like this. I'll tell you the story about Samson, how he was captured by the Jews and sent over to the team to get punished. So he was saying that it's better to be punished by your enemy than by your brother. Your brother will punish you extra hard. you understand? So here's a beautiful story to illustrate that. So there was a uh, piece of gold laying on a blacksmith's table. And the gold looked at the hammer banging the iron. Every time the hammer banged the iron, the iron called out with this huge voice. Ding! Like a ringing noise. 
So right away the gold looked at the iron and said, how come you make such a noise like that? When I get hit with the hammer, I don't make a noise like that. So he said, you know why? Because I'm getting hit by my brother. That's why. I thought that was a beautiful story to illustrate that point. Oh, this is a good question. If somebody came and asked you this question, I'll give you 30 seconds to think of the answer. Name me a big Sadiq in the Torah that made a vow and it ended up in a tragedy. And I'm saying a big Sadiq. A Sadiq so big you can consider him an angel. Wow, that's giving you too much information. By now you should have got the answer if you're really stuck to Hashem in the Torah. The answer should have jumped out of your head and met like a lion attacking a gazelle. The answer is Yaakov when he made the vow that whoever has the Terafim would die and Rachel ended up dying because unbeknownst to him she was sitting on it and had it and she took it away for a noble cause but because he made a vow and he was such a big Sadiq his wife died. That's what the Torah says. When you make a vow like that your wife will die. I'll tell you a dope story right now about a wife and a vow. <laughs> this guy comes to the rabbi of his community and says, Rabbi, I want my wife dead. So the rabbi said, dead? God forbid. Divorce. He said, no. She's wicked. She's evil. She's nasty. She's rude. She's arrogant. I want her dead and I want her dead now. So the rabbi realized there'd be no way to convince him not to murder his wife. So he started to come up with a plan to like keep him in the synagogue, hoping to calm him down. So he said to him, okay, I tell you what, let's take out the Torah. You'll make a vow that you're going to give $5 million to the shul. We know that you're a billionaire, but you're stingy. You don't ever give. And they both giggled. He said, and then you'll make the vow and you'll make fun of the vow. You'll never pay the vow. And I'll pray to God that in two months, your wife dies. And this way, it won't be messy. She'll die like the Amorites died. No, like the soldiers of San Kharib died in their sleep, fully clothed, with honor. No problem. So he looked at the rabbi. He said, wow, rabbi, you're such a genius. That was a great way to solve my problem. So he ran out of the synagogue on the way home. As he left the synagogue, the rabbi said to him, wait, before you go, just know she's going to die in two months. You just went through this whole thing. You took the name of Hashem in vain. You made a vow, you swore in the Torah, making fun, knowing that Hashem is going to kill your wife in two months. So just know that when you're with her now for these last two months, you better treat her like a queen. And I'm not playing with you. You better treat her like she is everything. And he said, why? He said, because in two months she's going to die. She's going to be standing in front of Hashem to get judged. And your name is going to come up. You don't want her to badmouth you in Shemayim, bro. Trust me. So he said, you know what, Rabbi, you're a genius. Right away, he left. He bought his wife candy and flowers and a new car. And he started being so nice to her that the wife said to her, you know what? If he's being that nice, I can also be nice. And she started to be nice. And believe it or not, they fell back in love. So like the day before the two months was up, he runs back to the rabbi. He said, Rabbi, you have to annul the vow. You have to annul the vow. Rabbi said, well, annul the vow, bro. You took out the Torah. You swore in the name of God. Are you crazy? There's no way I can annul the vow, bro. She's going to die tomorrow at 12 o'clock. That's it. Seal signed and delivered. Have a nice day. And the rabbi walked away. He grabbed the rabbi by the foot. The rabbi was dragging him. He goes, I'm going to go pray mincha. You got to leave me alone, bro. He said, no, rabbi, you don't understand. I'm in love with my wife and I don't want her to die. So the rabbi said, what? He said, you heard me. I started acting nice to her and then she started acting nice to me. And we fell back in love. So the rabbi looked in his face. He was crying. The rabbi felt bad. He said to him, you know what? I found a way. Give me the $5 million and she'll live. Right away, he took out his book wrote a $5 million check, gave it to him. And that's the story. That's a beautiful story with a vow. And we know that your wife can die when you make a vow. Not even a false vow, a regular vow. Why? I tell you why. Because it's chutzpah to Hashem when you make a vow. Who are you to make a vow that in the next month you're going to do ABC? You don't know what's going to happen in the next second. So by assuming that you already know the future... 
you're already showing there's like God forbid two gods God forbid so for that don't even utter the vow even though sometimes it's permitted to make a vow to say you know I'm going to change I'm going to never break Shabbat again I'm going to do this I'm going to do that no problem that vow is commendable and you can do it but I suggest never to make a vow say God please help me overcome my temptations God help me with my sin God please bless me God please be by my side God please be with me always and once again you hear the thunder once again I'll say the bracha you know why I'm going to say it again and you have to be careful when you take God's name in vain so you don't just say it like stomp stomp because the storm kind of went away and came back and I know that because the rain stopped Blessed are you, Lord, our God, King of the universe, who does wonders to nature. You say that, Bracha, when you hear the thunder and the rain. I'll tell you a beautiful story right now with rain, with Rabbi Tan Khum. What a beautiful story. So during his time, there was a huge famine, and he was the head rabbi, so the people came to him and begged him, Rabbi, Rabbi. You have to pray to God to have mercy on us. So he said, have mercy on each other and God will have mercy on you. So right away, they started doing acts of kindness and this and that. So what happened? One of the guys there divorced his wife because his wife treated him like garbage. She cheated on him. She did this, she did that, whatever. So he divorced her. So the people in the city saw that he went over to her and met with her, which is like a big no-no, especially back then. When the world was very pure, you know, because once you get divorced from your wife, that's it. She, you can never be with her again, especially if she's with another man. So they saw him like with her. So right away, they brought him to Rabbi Tanhum and complained. He's, he's going to stop the blessing of God. This is why it didn't rain. We've all been giving charity, but it's his fault. This is ridiculous. He knows better. So Rabbi Tanhum took him into the court and said to him, What's the problem, bro? You know that. You're so he said, Rabbi. I didn't want to say anything, but she's very poor. And I went there to give her money. I felt bad for her. When you gave us a speech about having mercy on others, right away my heart felt mercy for her. Even though she hurt me. Even though she cheated on me. I didn't go there to be with her. I didn't go there to rekindle my love for her. I went there to give her money because her husband died and she was struggling. That's why I went. Rabbi Tafkum looked up to Shabbat. And said to Hashem, the Jews like this, you're not going to make it rain. And it started to rain. See, these are stories that touch my soul. And touch my heart. And they're beautiful. And may they sink in my soul when I listen to them. When I go to sleep. You heard me correct. I listen to my talks. When I go to sleep. So that when I'm sleeping, the word of God infuses into my brain. Yo, it refines your character and purifies your soul even when you're sleeping. It might be even more when you're sleeping. Because the word now is connected directly to the soul. No physical body in the way. The physical body is a barrier to the soul. The goal of the soul is to jump that barrier. To use the body to perform the mitzvah, but at the same time, not to get sucked into the desires of the body the physical material desires you know why because when you get addicted to the car to the women to the food to whatever it may be it's a strong addiction and you're going to need it to survive and that's when it's going to be a major problem for you because then breaking that addiction it's like having a demon on your back that you have to fight first of all he has you in a chokehold He's ready to choke you out, bro. He has you, you know, when they get the the forearm under the chin and now they're going to make you tap out. You're in that kind of a position. How are you going to get out? You could. Pray to Hashem, he'll get you out. No problem. Just like he got Menashe away from his captors when they captured him. Pray to every one of his gods. None of his gods answered him. Finally, he realized the stupidity. He called out to the real God. And God of his mercy saved him. And the angels came to him and said, how could you save him? He put an idol in the temple courtyard and you're going to save him? Are you kidding me? Where's the justice? They questioned Hashem. So Hashem said, the reason I'm forgiving him is because he's sincere. 
And when you're sincere, I must forgive you. Or else, what else did I make Chuba for? The guy's going to come now, pour out his heart, tell me he's sorry, and I'm going to deny him? Then everybody's going to look at this story and say, so then what chance do I have? And they're not going to do Chuba. Right away, the angels acquiesced and understood the point. You see, it's not that Hashem loves the wicked, the opposite, He wants to destroy them. It's that Hashem wants the wicked to return and to repent from their ways. That's what He wants. And that's why I love Him more than anything. Because He's such justice. Do you see how I said that? That's the ultimate understanding of God. He wants the wicked dead. But He'd rather them come back and repent. In other words, while they're in the status of wicked, He's not chilling with them. He's not around them. Shechina runs away from them. He will tell you straight up, I don't want to be around you. But the minute, the nanosecond you decide to change, even in thought, right away he'll pop up. Right away he'll pop up like my mother when she pops up into the room and doesn't announce herself. Bro, I cannot. do you know a family member that you have that you live with that will just pop up? Hey, what are you doing? And you don't even know they're there and you jump up? She does that a lot, yo. So that's how Hashem is going to pop up. You're not even going to know he's there. And then boom, he's going to pop up. And it's going to scare you. You better fear God, bro. I'm telling you right now. I don't care what rabbis today tell you, bro. These rabbis today, (laughs) a lot of them are definitely on the wrong path. And it's scary. Don't fear God. Raise your hand if you heard a rabbi tell you not to fear God. I had a few tell me that. I remember I said to this one Chabad guy, I said, do you respect Melch Shlomo? He said, of course. He's a giant Sadiq. I said, he said, Hashem. He said, I disagree with that. <laughs> I looked at him like, yo, what a clown. This guy looks like a huge rabbi. You disagree with that? What is there to disagree with, bro? When you have fear, it prevents you from doing sins. When you stop doing sins, you become mega holy. If the goal of the soul is to be holy, then we have to figure out a way to stop sinning. One great way to stop sinning is to really fear God. And you're going to come and tell the people not to fear God. It's like this one rabbi the other day I heard say, oh, don't say a full berchat amazon. This is not a halal. Don't say a full berchat amazon. Are you kidding me? You could say the first three berchot, that's from Hashem, the rest are from the rabbis. Say the whole thing, bro. Are you kidding me? Say the first 30 seconds, bro. You're good. Nobody has covenant to say more than 30 seconds. But trust me when I tell you. If I was you, I would not say the full Barakat Amazon. He's acting like there's a Barakat Amazon Shalem and a Barakat Amazon Chetzi. Which there really is if you think about it. Because I told you, it's just the first Tibachot. Yo, imploring the people to speed through Barakat Amazon. How sad is that? Look at some of the prayers in Barakat Amazon. And this is just towards the end. This isn't even the prayers that are said by the rabbis and the, by the by Hashem Himself. Hashem is telling us, eat and be satisfied, but don't forget to bless your God for the good land He gave you. And this is what it says towards the end that the rabbis wrote. But these are powerful blessings. May the merciful one make peace amongst us. May the merciful, I'm not saying it in order. May the merciful one make peace amongst us. May the merciful one break the yoke of oppression speedily from our neck. And then right after it, it says, May the blessed one, no, may the merciful one bring us speedily upright to our land. May the merciful one give us sustenance with respect, not with disgrace. May the merciful one make us successful in all our endeavors. I like that. May he bless us a complete blessing like Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Wow. That alone. (laughs) That alone is like such a powerful bracha, bro. Don't you understand? The power of brachat amazon. I said in one of my last talks, I would tell you to eat bread all day and say the full brachat amazon with kavanah, thinking about every word that you say and knowing that this food that you ate Gave you sustenance to leave it to live another day to praise God. That's it. That's why we allow you to break a Shabbat so that you can live to keep another Shabbat. 
You understand? Dear God, please bless the nation of Israel and Kaddish Baruch. Please look at how the Goyim treat us, Hashem. Please look at how they want us destroyed, how they hate us. Dear God, may the notes that I'm about to say come out perfect. Amen. He who is patient is greater than he who is mighty. Yiftach was punished with leprosy. That's what it says. And he was buried in different cities because his limbs fell off. Boaz was the great-grandfather of King David. He was extremely righteous but was punished for not having compassion on those who were less fortunate than him. He did this to Manoah, Samson's father. He was punished and all his children died. Then he did repentance, married Ruth, and had Obed, the grandfather of King David. When we left Egypt, we went in the desert as far as the Red Sea and came to Kadesh. Then we sent messengers to the kings of Edom saying, let us please pass to your land. But the king did not listen. Moab was also not willing to listen. So Israel stayed in Kadesh. Then we went around the land of Moab and Edom and camped across Arnon. When Israel sent messengers to the king of Cheshbon, Shichon, king of the Amorites, he did not allow Israel to pass through the border and came out to fight and he was defeated. We took over all the boundaries of the Amorites from the Arnon River to the Hayabakuk and from the desert to the Jordan. Balak ben Sipor was the king of Moab. God sent Samson to punish the Pishtim. Nobody believes the truth when the lies more entertaining. The Arnon River flows westward from the desert into the Dead Sea. It formed the northern border of Moab. Across the Arnon lay the territory of the Amorites, ruled by two mighty kings, Shichon and Og, king of Bashan. The Jews camped at Aror and asked the Amorites permission to cross the land. Making any kind of vow is an assumption that you know what will happen in the future and is therefore not allowed. The high priest was always willing to give the descendants. Oh, the high priesthood was always meant to be given to the descendants of Pinchas, but it was taken away for 42 years because he didn't humble himself to meet with Yiftach. The prophet Ezekiel said, Now, son of man, I have appointed you as a watchman for the house of Israel. You will hear a word from my mouth and warn them of it. I like that. There were four that made vows, two good and two bad. Yiftach and Yaakov both made vows, and it was a tragedy. Yiftach had to sacrifice his daughter, which he didn't, but he did. And Yaakov had Rachel killed with his vow. And the two good vows were the Jewish people who called to Hashem and said that if you save us, we'll give you all the spoils. And they did, and they were saved. And Chana, who had the prophet Shmuel, love you Hashem. See, I don't like reading from the notes, but that came out pretty smooth. But let me just check right here and see. Let's see, second book of Kings, 19, 28. Because you provoked me, your roaring came up in my ears. Let me say to my... This is a good lesson for you. I talk in text when I do my notes. So sometimes the word my, which is talking about God, has to be a capital M. So I have to pause it, stop what I'm saying, and fix that out of respect and honor for God. Second book of Kings 19.28. Because you provoked me, your roaring came up in my ears. I have put my hook in your nose and my ring in your lips. And I will bring you back on the way by which you came. That's what Hashem said to San Kharif. He treated him like an animal that's forced to go to the slaughter. They put hooks in his cheek, a ring in his nose. The slightest of resistance is extremely painful. So the animal gives in and is led to his death. That's what he did to San Kharif. Yo, he killed 185,000 of his soldiers, except for five. And the craziest thing was they all died in their sleep fully clothed. Why? Because they came from Shem. And Shem covered the father, the nakedness of his father. So measure for measure, Hashem said, I'm going to kill them, but I'm going to allow them to die with dignity and be buried. And that's exactly what happened. And that's mega deep. That's how Hashem does measure for measure. It could be from a thousand years prior. You should know that the temple was destroyed during King Sedkia's reign. Time is something that cannot be bought, cannot be wagered with God, and is not in an endless supply. Each and every day is a canvas to be painted. 
The way you think influences the way you feel. I like that. A person should never be ashamed to admit his mistakes. If he wronged someone, he should admit it and ask for forgiveness. He should not let his pride stop him. He may be surprised how readily his apology is accepted. But if he's stubborn and persists, he will only make the matters worse. What the? A person should never be ashamed to admit his mistakes. If he wronged someone, he should admit it and ask for forgiveness. He should not let his pride stop him. He may be surprised how readily his apology is accepted. But if his stubborn persists, if his stubbornness persists, he will only make the matters worse. When a sinful person regrets, I like this. When a sinful person begins to regret his wicked ways and has thoughts of repentance, the Satan right away tries to stop him before he puts his thoughts into practice. He says to him, "What a disgrace it will be for a person like you to repent." You have been a sinner all your life. If you repent now, it'll mean that you'll have to admit you were wrong all these years. Your whole life would have been a waste. And you'll have to admit it in front of the righteous while they look down upon you. Are you going to be able to look them in the face? Wow, that's the Satan is such a, yo, so cunning. It's ridiculous, bro. There's a heavy responsibility that rests on the leaders of the community. They must bear the blame for every injustice that is done. Even if they do not have the power to stop it, they must at least voice their disapproval. Otherwise, their silence will be construed as a sign of their consent. This is one of the sins that contributed to the destruction of the Second Temple. The rabbis witnessed one man publicly disgracing another. They said nothing and did not try to stop it. The man who was disgraced and was very bitter over the injustice went to the Romans and became an enemy of the rabbis and the Jewish people. He informed, he informed against them to the Romans and slandered them. And in the war that followed, the temple was destroyed and the Jewish people became even more enslaved to Rome. Wow. You, whose kindness and mercy is beyond all human comprehension, can certainly not ignore the suffering of your children of your beloved servants Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Dear God, please listen to what I'm about to say, Akkadish Baruch because in the merit of this, I want you to save us, Akkadish Baruch You, who are the master, not of war, even though you are, the master of mercy and the master of compassion, are you not going to have mercy on your own children to save us? From this time that's about to come, it will be a time of distress for Yaakov. Why? Because they left the Torah. Because they disrespected God. Because they became transgender. Because they marched in a gay pride parade. Because they went against God openly in public and smiled. The punishment is going to be coming. Please open the hearts of your children to accept these words and any other words of Torah that may be spoken into existence in the universe to bring each one of your children back to you with love and with mercy. You, who are the king of all kings, the master of mercy and compassion, will you not have mercy on your own children to save us, to help us, to uplift us? There has to be a merit that you could find in our nation stand up and say in the name of Eretz Yisrael and in the name of Klai Yisrael please have mercy on us I love you I love you because you help me be a better person I love you because you help me be a better person let me say that again because that's the goal be more kind be extra humble be loving be compassionate be merciful a person should never let himself be bothered by the insults of human beings even of the most powerful kings for honor and glory comes not from them but from God the most beloved of God is sometimes the one whom others value the least if a person is not given a sign by God he has no right to make up a sign himself that is shirking his duty to think and discover the right answer for himself. It's an attempt to find an easy solution when no such solution exists. 
If he relies upon it, he may make a terrible mistake. You cannot make a vow. You know why? Because you're insinuating that you know what's going to happen in the future and nobody knows. Only God knows. Since they always relied upon God at times when it is proper to do so, God forgave them this time when it was not. That's dope. There are four days during the year which the world is judged. Pesach, Shavuot, Rosh Hashanah, and Sukkot. One should always refrain from making a vow because it shows that he thinks that he's in control. Dear God, thank you so much for blessing me, my family, and the nation of Israel always. Because even though we might go through some hard times, you're still keeping us alive and that alone is a miracle. Have you ever studied biology and learned about how the human brain works? Go do that if you want to understand the beauty of God and His creation. And always remember that every creation has a creator. And no one created God. He is the creator of all creations. So He was already here and everything came to Him. Remember that. And remember that the earth is rotating around the sun. And the only place where we can have a human race with tests, with emotions with a conscious, with punishments for the wicked, rewards for the righteous, karma, judgment, justice, and everything else you see in this world of lies. Olam the Elam, Hashem is concealing himself in the Olam. I love you, Hashem, for always and forever. Just like you love the nation of Israel for always and forever.